Thank you so much to Sophie, Monica and Caitlin for that very insightful um, and powerful testimony um, from the three of you. And thank you so much for sharing your stories, which is so personal, um, but we all get such value from sharing our stories with one another. And you touched on that, that it's that sharing your experiences and helping others and feeling connected is so important. Um, we had a question here from, can you please share? Sorry, I've dropped it out for a moment there. Um, can you please share, Sophie, some of your um, tools that you help for mental strategy, if possible, please? Yes, um, so I was trying to, um, I had a pretty good think about this when I was kind of writing and like putting together my presentation for this. And I think I find it really hard to kind of name the tip, the tips that I have for other people, um, even for myself, because I think they've just become part of my kind of day to day. And I don't really even know what I do that does help or I didn't do before. Um, I do often, so my stomach pain is kind of one of my biggest Fabry symptoms. And I um, have a heat pack, which is really, really good. Um, it doesn't, you know, completely get the pain away, but it really um, helps while it is on. So I, I generally just like, if I do get stomach pain, I um, go and lie in bed or on the couch and just put my heat pack on yeah. or like a bath. I find, um, yeah, just heat is really good and not doing too much activity. I think sometimes like a gentle walk can be good, but yeah, and other tips I found just uh, kind of noticing what different foods set set my stomach off more, um, and yeah, I think like keeping away if if it's really hot, I generally don't do heaps of exercise because that will really um, make the pain in my hands and feet come back. Um, yeah, I don't really have many other no. tips. No, thank, thanks. That's good. But Monica, you talked about how important music is for you and TV and reading and connecting with your friends. So I suppose that reiterates what um, you also talked about, Caitlin, about having that balance in your life and not necessarily making your fabric disease define you. That's just one aspect of your personality um, or of not your personality, I shouldn't say your life. Um, and just trying to bring in those other highlights, I suppose, to um, lift you up. Um, did you want to comment further on that, Monica or Caitlin? I think it's just a matter of honestly trial and error. When it first mm -hmm. starts, you don't really know what's going to work. You just kind of have a rough idea what's worked for other people, but it won't necessarily work for you. So you've got to try and work out what is the best mm -hmm. way to approach it for yourself. It just takes a bit of time, but once you know, it's definitely a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. It's such an individual journey and um, and we know that Fabry can have very different impacts between, between people. Um, every case is really unique. So it is that trial and error phase that Monica and Sophie have sort of um, alluded to uh, that's, that makes it really personal and I suppose hard to share a lot of tips because, yeah, as Sophie said, it's stuff that you've picked up along the way that works for you specifically. I think something that was interesting that all three of you touched on is that um, self-compassion and um, not just self-awareness but also self-compassion and being kind to yourself and looking after your own well-being so that then you can be the best that you can be as well. So I think that was yeah, that interesting aspect and, and not being afraid to put yourself first and put your hand up and ask for help when you need it. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, would anyone like to expand on that comment perhaps? Or, I or then, think, yes, sorry, go. Sorry. As I'm sorry, I think it's a matter of realising that you're not going to be, you don't have the same energy levels, you don't have the same life as all the other kids you're trying to keep up with. And it's a matter of actually accepting I'm not able to play like I used to play netball. I'm not able to play a full game of netball. But the fact that I can play half a game in summer is an achievement to what it used to be mm -hmm. and kind of just a little wins kind of thing like that. But it's, once again, takes a bit of time to accept. Yeah, and I think it's it's the most difficult thing is finding that balance between 
accepting that you do have different kind of standards um, to other people and you shouldn't kind of just see other people's success and try and live up to that, you know, um, but then also not letting it overtake your life. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hard balance to find. I completely agree with Sophie and Monica and have both used the word acceptance, which uh, re really resonates with me because I actually think that's kind of the first huge hurdle that you go through. I know that for Monica and Sophie, their diagnosis was very different to mine and, and had sort of unique challenges. For me, um, the challenge was still cognitively understanding what the disease was, even though I always knew I had it. Um, you go through life thinking you're, you're still thinking you're a normal kid um, and it's sort of not till you hit your teen years when when you really have those symptoms that you yeah I had to accept that I have this illness and that my life will be different to my friends um, and I, yeah I just think acceptance is a huge chapter and there's all those emotions that come with it denial anger um, and then eventually <sighs> trying to get that healthy level of acceptance where we you know your limitations because that's kind of how you get to the self-compassion is acceptance first and then the other question I wanted to touch on and it's something I'm assuming that you've all had to um, learn as part of that transition from a pediatric to an adult phase is how to advocate for yourself and how to have those conversations with the medical specialists um, did any of you have anything to share there or a journey things you've learned along that part of the way? Yeah, I think um, retaining a healthy level of scepticism is is good. Um, and it's not because there's medical professions that necessarily have ill intentions. It's not that at all. It's just that you're dealing with a system um, that's that's not perfect. Um, you're dealing with people who are under-resourced, um, you know, in, in terms of time and money. And so um, you can't assume that that everyone that you come by is doing um, exceptional or, or knows you well enough to, to make the right decision for you. And so I think just that having that little bit of scepticism where you, you will ask questions um and and you do have to be a bit vulnerable to, to share information about yourself about what you're thinking and feeling um yeah as you navigate the system but it's it's probably been my biggest challenge has been navigating the medical system especially as a, a carer it's certainly mm -hmm. hard work and really exhausting so if you can find someone to um go on that journey with you I think that's important completely agree I think the first I mean my mom still comes to all the big appointments with me um so my mom has it as well and we go with each other for the big six monthly appointment at the Royal Melbourne um just having someone there who's going through the same thing is really helpful even if I just have a specialist appointment like I still need someone there to help me out sometimes and it's okay to say I need you there um especially because you walk in there and there's all this information you need to remember, but you're, you know, overwhelmed and trying to remember everything. Um, so even just having someone with you, I know it's not always possible, but where it is, it makes a big difference, like Caitlin said. Yeah, Sophie, did you have to have anything to add on that? Or nothing further? Yeah. Um, I don't think so. I think I'm still learning to advocate for myself. Um, I think... I yeah it's really interesting um kind of learning that like as much as they try and as much kind of care as they give or want to give like doctors don't know everything particularly about such a rare disease so kind of got to go based on what you know from your experience and kind of what your body can handle and things like that um what your life can handle without having too much of an impact on the day-to-day um yeah tricky one we've had an interesting comment here from Kathy just talking about how important it is to give um the hospitals that feedback about that transition from pediatric to adult care 
you know, how the, the paediatric transition to adult patients has got such a wealth of knowledge in what was good, what was bad, what could be improved. So I think we'll take that as a comment that it's just food for thought, isn't it, for future that um, hospitals need that, that that information and that feedback. I think it's really um, would be useful for so many other patients going through that same journey. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, you just talked about, Caitlin, um, just quickly about seeing a genetic counsellor and how much that had helped, has helped you. Um, did you want to elaborate any more on that, that process and how you felt, was that easy, difficult? Um, how did you go accessing those resources, things like that? Yeah, sure. I, I started with, um, by talking with Michael Chen at Westmead um, and as Sophie described um, he's incredibly calm and uh, caring and he's kind of my go-to so I, I started with him asking um, who can I see who would you recommend uh, and he he made the process really quite easy uh, I just I think it does go back to that sort of point though about managing the medical system is asking the questions Michael had discussed sort of uh, fertility options back when I first entered Westmead as an adult when I was 18. And at that time, that was so far from my mind. I remember he gave me a brochure. To be honest, it probably ended up in the recycle bin because at that time, it was just not not even a consideration. And then fast forward a few years, I, I'm thinking back to that conversation with, with Michael and thinking, oh, I sort of wish I had that brochure. Um, got a few questions and things I want to ask now. And so, yeah, I it just I just had to take that initiative there of of giving his receptionist a call and saying, actually, like you know, I have got some questions and and where can you put me in the right direction? So it's just kind of taking that initiative of going um, and finding the right people. And but that can be really challenging, and I think I waited about eight months for that appointment. Uh, so, yeah, time again. It comes back to the under resourcing and and things like that. Things can take time and aren't always easy, and that's why yeah, if you can have someone support you on that journey, I'd recommend it. Lovely. Um, and then just quickly, we just um. We've got a question here, Sophie. Can you please share some of the tools you use to manage your mental health on a day-to-day -day basis? Like what strategies or what tools do you have in particular if you were able to elaborate? Yeah, mental health is one I've definitely, I think I've improved on more than, or I have better a better understanding of than my physical health, which is often not the way. But I think um, I, I really have found that, you know, like walking, and listening to podcasts is just my kind of number one for my mental health. So I kind of make sure I do that each day. Um, and I, um, what do I, 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 so I think um, it can be a bit tricky because you kind of told that like mindfulness and meditation, other things that are going to fix, you know, like, you know, that should be tried or like a really helpful. And I think, you just got to find what works for you. Um, I have gone through like stages where I found those kind of techniques really helpful, but I find sometimes they've, you know, been posed as kind of ways to deal with my physical health. And I think um, I haven't found it useful in that way, but I definitely find, I found also actually um, to help my mental health, I've, it's been quite scary, um, but I've been more vulnerable about my, Fabry um and kind of told more people about it um and I think that has been really good for my mental health because it's made me know that others are aware of things um and so if I do have any kind of issues I can bring it up and they have a bit of an understanding um so yeah I think just like talking to other people is really good and mm -hmm. finding the things that yeah you find for yourself yeah. that works for you yeah wonderful well, thank you so much, ladies. Um, thank you, Monica, Sophie and Caitlin for your time this afternoon and for sharing your incredible um, insights into um, your journey, but then your personal stories. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you again. So we're moving into our break session now. Um, so there will be a 15 minute um, break.
and um, we'll resume at 14.50, so 2.50, with the presentation by Dr. Rees. So thank you all so much, and thank you to our presenters so far.